Hi, I'm Dan Rockmore, director of the William H. Newcomb Institute for Computational Science here at Dartmouth College. And on behalf of the college and the Newcomb Institute, I'd like to welcome you to this year's Winter Donahoe Colloquium, The AI of Emotion, from Dr. Rana L. Kaliubi. The Donahoe Colloquium is an ongoing series of public lectures aimed at increasing awareness of the many important and sometimes surprising places in which computational ideas are shaping our lives. These events are made possible by a generous gift from David, Mickey, and Dan Donahoe in honor of Dan's graduation as a member of the class of 2006. It's a central piece of the larger mission of the Newcomb Institute, whose aim is to support and integrate computational thinking and computational ideas throughout the Dartmouth community. The Institute itself is made possible through the generosity of Bill Newcomb, Dartmouth class of 64, and former trustee of the college. Among the most societally significant offshoots of computational science are our many and various attempts, successes, and even failures to embody intelligence in machines. This is what we call artificial intelligence, a phrase that first appeared in a 1955 proposal to the Rockefeller Foundation by AI legend John McCarthy. He was then a Dartmouth mathematician. Dartmouth was looking for support, uh, McCarthy was looking for support to convene a summer institute at Dartmouth to study the mechanisms and possibilities of encoding symbolic reasoning in a first generation of programmable computers. In the words of the proposal, quote, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to simulate it. An attempt will be made to find how to make machines use language, form abstractions and concepts, solve kinds of problems now reserved for humans and to improve themselves, end quote. Most of the AI pioneers were mathematicians and engineers, and the problem solving that they valued constrained the early goals of much of early AI work. Real, quote, intelligence, unquote, was to them manifested in the kinds of thinking that went into winning a game of chess or proving a theorem in geometry. And those sorts of aims guided a good deal of early AI research. But as our notions of intelligence have diversified to encompass a broad range of human abilities, the aims of artificial intelligence have broadened in tandem. In particular, as machines play larger and larger roles in our lives, those who design these machines are increasingly finding themselves in the position of working to engineer, or at least trying to engineer, the very qualities that as a society we have often claimed are the defining characteristics of being human. These range from the goal of endowing an android artist with creative spirit, enabling moral reasoning in an unmanned motor car, or to encoding empathy in a robot caregiver. The last of these is among the most intriguing of goals. Is it possible to build an emotionally responsive machine? In short, is emotional intelligence within the realm of machine intelligence? This is the arresting and intriguing question that's being tackled by the field of affective computing. It's a crucial piece of a broad integrative effort of computational, engineering, and psychological sciences to make possible in machines the identification of emotional states in humans, and it's the topic of today's lecture. We're extremely fortunate to have with us today one of the pioneers in the field of affective computing, Rana L. Kaliubi, co-founder and CEO of the technology company Affectiva. Rana holds a BSc and MSc in computer science from the American University in Cairo and a PhD from the computer laboratory at the University of Cambridge. Prior to founding Affectiva as a research scientist at MIT Media Lab, Rana spearheaded the applications of emotion technology in a variety of fields, including mental health and autism research. Her work has appeared in numerous publications, including The New Yorker, Wired, Forbes, Fast Company, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, CNN, CBS, Time Magazine, Fortune, and Reddit. She was recognized by the publication Entrepreneur as one of the seven most powerful women to watch in 2014. She's been inducted into the Women in Engineering Hall of Fame and is a recipient of the 2012 Technology Review's Top Innovators Under 35 Award, listed on ad ages 40 under 40, and is the recipient of Smithsonian Magazine's 2015 American Ingenuity Award for Technology. Rana is also a member of the World Economic Forum's Global Future Council on Artificial Intelligence and Robotics. 
Please join me in welcoming Rana L. Kaliubi as our winter 2017 Donahoe Colloquium speaker. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me here today. Thanks, Dan, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, my entire career has, a bit, has been about um, this idea of artificial emotional intelligence, um, or what we call emotion AI. So our emotions influence every aspect of our lives, from um, our health and well-being, to how we, you know, how uh, the decisions we make, what we purchase, how we learn, Big decisions or small decisions. It could be everything from what you had for breakfast or lunch to big decisions like who you're going to vote for or where you're going to live. And ultimately how we connect and communicate with one another. We are increasingly surrounded by, you know, advanced technologies, smart technologies with massive and autonomous capabilities, right? Like these are autonomous cars or advanced social robotics and all these technologies and systems right now have advanced IQ, high you know, cognitive intelligence, but no emotional intelligence. Now we know from years and years of research around human intelligence that emotional and social intelligence is just as important as your cognitive intelligence. In fact, people who have higher EQs, higher emotion quotients, tend to be more likable, they're more persuasive, they tend to have better and more successful both professional and personal um, lives. And we think that there is an analogy in machine intelligence that make, you know, that kind of makes an argument for emotional intelligence as well. And this is particularly true because our interactions with technology around us is becoming a lot more conversational and a lot more perceptual and a, a lot more relational. So, you know, we're stuck to our phones, we're very intimate with the devices that are part of our, um, you know, whether it's your smartphone or other devices at home like an Amazon Alexa. And so we're really seeing this trend where um, there's disruption or a transformation of human computer interfaces. And again, we think that empathy and having emotional intelligence sits at the very core of that. So I ask, my team and I ask, what if technology could identify human emotions just the way we, we do as humans? And what if computers could tell the difference between a smile and a smirk? Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, how we do that. It, 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 you know, humans do that subconsciously and it comes, for most of us, it comes pretty easily. Um, but for computers, it's a pretty complex task. <laughs> What if our cars could sense our emotions and adapt to that in a way, in a meaningful way that increases safety and, and reduces road rage um, and distraction? And this is probably the one that, I, uh, that I'm most passionate about. So what if doctors could identify your mental health the same way um, they do that with other vital signs? So when you walk into a doctor's office today, the doctor does not ask you for your blood pressure. They just measure it and they measure it objectively. But with mental health, the state, the gold standard is still survey. You ask people, it's a self-reported um, um, survey. So you ask people on a scale from one to 10, like how sad are you today? Or how depressed are you feeling? Or how much pain are you in? And it's very subjective data. Um, and I think there is an alternative to that, a better alternative. We can do better. We can come up with more objective ways to measure this kind of um, mental state um, um, data in a more continuous and objective way. <clears throat> and then ultimately, what if our social robots could actually be social <laughs> and be able to respond and adapt to, um, you know, and build rapport with, with their human users? And then if you, if you kind of project that onto our everyday Internet of Things, what if your Internet of Things, what if, you know, our home devices had an emotion chip that could sense and identify your emotions and personalize and uh, make recommendations. My favorite is, example is what if your smart fridge had this emotion chip and it could identify that you're stressed and lock down and not allow you to binge <laughs> on this uh, Ben and Jerry's chocolate, you know, chocolate chip cookie dough. <laughs> um, so our, view, uh, our vision as a team is to humanize technology with, with emotional intelligence. And I think that will change, fundamentally change how we connect and communicate with our machines but also how we connect and communicate with each other as humans. 
And there's a lot of, um, you know, the, basically there's two sides to this coin. One is to allow machines to respond in real time and adapt and personalize. But the other is in the aggregate form, this data can be very powerful to businesses. And it's something, I guess, when I started research in this space that we, we didn't realize that. And that's how we ended up kind of starting a company because there is a lot of commercial interest in people's emotional responses and emotional profiles. Um, so I thought I'd share a little bit about my story, how, how I got there. Um, how, um, so um, this is me. This, is, this was the first and last time I smoked a cigarette. <laughs> oh, I didn't really smoke one. Um, but um, I grew up, I'm Egyptian. So I was born in Cairo and I grew up in the Middle East. Um, we were in Kuwait right until the first Gulf War when our family had to evacuate. This is actually a picture taken from our house. So these are the Iraqi tanks. Um, so that was pretty traumatic. We moved back to Cairo and um, uh, I eventually studied computer science at the American University in Cairo. Um, and you know, I took a whole bunch of courses. So I did a lot of compiler and operating system. And, but I was most intrigued by hum the HCI courses because I recognized that computers and technology are really influencing how we're connecting with one another. And that kind of intrigued me. Um, so from that point on, I applied to a, for a PhD program at Cambridge University. I was, it was my first uh, broad experience. So I remember getting to Cambridge and I was thousands of miles away from home. And I, um, I used to spend about eight hours a day in front of my laptop. Um, so it, so I ended up, it ended up being the most intimate device that I interacted with. Yet it had absolutely no clue how I was feeling. So there were days when I'd be really down or really stressed because of a deadline. And this thing would sit there and it would, you know, Clippy would show up and would twirl and would say, oh, can I help you? I'm like, no, like, <laughs> it would be great if you just went away. Um, but it also, I realized that my laptop was my portal to communicating back with my family back home. And often I would feel really homesick and sometimes I'd even be in tears and the best I could do was kind of send them this emoji, right? So it, again, I started thinking about, um, you know, I felt like all our nuances, our emotional expressions were, were just um, disappearing in cyberspace. Um, so I became very fascinated about this idea of an emotional, you know, emotion mind reading machine. I was particularly interested in facial expressions. Our face is a very rich and complex canvas for communicating a wide range of social and emotional cues from joy and confusion to interest and anxiety. And I particularly um, kind of researched the science of facial emotions. It's been around for over 200 years. It started with this guy called Duchenne who um, used to electrically stimulate people's facial muscles. We do not do that anymore. <laughs> um, and then Charles Darwin had a seminal book where he talked about the expression of emotions in men and animals. It's an, it's an amazing book if you haven't read it. He has a chapter per class of emotions um, with, with, with pictures. And then in the 1970s, Paul Ekman and his group um, developed the facial action coding system, which is essentially a system to map your different facial muscles, there's about 45 of them, to what he called action units. So for example, you know, when you, the, the zygomatic muscle, which is what you pull or, 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 or um, yeah, turn on when you're smiling, um, th that maps to a smile, so that's action unit 12. If you do a brow furrow, that's the corrugator muscle and that's action unit four. So he developed this coding system. It takes about 100 hours of training to become a certified fax coder. Um, and then it takes you about five minutes to code a single minute of video. So it's very, very human intensive. It's not scalable at all. But it became the gold standard for a lot of psychological research around emotions and facial expressions. So what I did in my research is I used computer vision and machine learning to automate fax so that you could go from a video um, or a series of video frames to an inference about the emo person's emotional state. Um, and the very first presentation I gave at Cambridge, I, I basically said, this is the problem I'm tackling. I want to teach a computer to read people's facial expressions. And somebody in the audience said, you know, my brother has autism and he has a similar set of problems. Like he finds it really difficult to read people's nonverbal signals. So I started looking into autism and I realized um, you know, there was a body of research, a, a data set that was collected to help autistic kids. So that was the data set I used to train my algorithm. 
And then I realized there's an opportunity to take all this developments in the system that we built and embed it in a wearable device for autistic kids. So um, I ended up joining MIT Media Lab, Professor Rosalind Picard's group. She started the field of affective computing and we, we, uh, we together built um, very early kind of models of Google Glass. So it was a pair of eyeglasses with a little camera embedded in it and uh, um, this was way before smartphones. Um, but it connected to a device that ran the software. So if I had autism, I would wear the glasses on. It would give me real-time feedback around how, you know, how I'm doing and how my interactions with other people um, is, is going. So we deployed that at the Groden Center um, in Providence, and we were seeing really promising results. These kids were starting to do a lot more eye contact. They were starting to associate a facial expression with an emotion. And at, at about the same time, so this is a MIT Media Lab, they have very, very strong in industry connections. In fact, I think it's about 70% of the funding of the lab comes from industry sponsors, not the government. So, and twice a year we would host all these sponsors and we called it Sponsor Week and it was demo or die. You had to show, mm -hmm. um, you had to show a real, you know, an actual working version of the research you're um, developing. And so for three years in a row, these people would come and they'd say, have you thought about, like P&G would say, have you thought about using this technology in product testing? Or Fox News wanted to test the fall lineup. Um, and so I just kept a log of all these different use cases. And in 2009, um, Roz and I approached our lab director and we were like, we need 10 more research students because this is really not working. Like there's a lot of interest in what we're doing. And he said, you know what, this is not research anymore. This is a commercialization opportunity. Uh, and my career plan all along was to become faculty, and so I was like, hang on a second, you're messing with my career plan here. <laughs> um, but I thought about it, and I was intrigued by the idea of taking something I built and, and, and really scaling it, and, and seeing how it can change how people um, make decisions on a daily basis and connect with each other. So we started Affectiva in 2009. We're about 30 people now. Um, and our vision is to bring emotion AI to a whole bunch of, of um, industries. And so I'll walk you through some of the use cases and kind of some of the question marks. It's very early, so there's a lot of research to be done, a lot of open questions, um, but there's definitely interest in each of these different um, industries to apply our technology. And these are kind of a selection of partners and clients. Again, I'll, I'll kind of dive deep into that, but it's all over the place. There's robotics, there's healthcare companies, there's video communication, there's um, car companies, advertising research. And what I find really exciting is that when we spun out Affectiva, there was um, really no like understanding of this idea of emotion AI. So we had to name it emotion AI. We had to evangelize it. Like we kind of created a new industry within the subspace of AI. And just recently, we're now starting to get included in that discussion. And there's recognition that, yeah, empathy is going to matter in some of these AI systems. And that's, you know, it's, it's bubbling up to become front and center of the AI dialogue, which is exciting for us. OK, so how does this work? And I thought the best way to do this is to do a live demo. Um, and if you're interested, um, the app is available on um, iOS and Google Play, it's called Aftex Me. Let me see if we can get this work. So I need a guinea pig. <laughs> Who wants to give this a try? Sure. Yeah? Um, okay, what's your name? Said. Said, okay. All right, so let's see. How this works. So, <laughs> so it's, fi it's found your face right away. It's identified your gender as male. Oh, wow. um, you got me kind of worried for a little bit because you have a lot of hair. I oh. thought I was, I was like, maybe it'll get this wrong. <laughs> um, but, it's, but it's tracking you in real time. And basically, it's mapping your facial expressions um, to, to a label. So let's see how, you know, how well this does. Um, start with joy because that tends to be the easiest. There you go. But it doesn't have to be a big expression. Like, okay. try smiling. That's a smirk, because that's an asymmetric <laughs> smile. That was a smirk. Okay. That's awesome. <laughs> Brow furrow? 
That's a brow raise. Yep, that's their fry. What's the fur? Brow raise? fur was this one. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Um, lip pucker. <laughs> lip pucker is a Kardashian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> more, a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Lip suck. Lip suck is that one. Oh, okay. There you go. So, um, yeah, and then, it, and then it basically also maps it to um, an emoji. So if you look shocked or you stick your tongue out, you can try any of these. Yeah, there you go. Maybe. My tongue is really small, so there's no echo. <laughs> okay. Um, look, look shocked or surprised. It also does multi-face. Let me see if I can get into the, um, let's see if we can get us both in here. I think we are. We need to huddle. Okay. <laughs> there we go. Oh, are you losing? Oh, oh, okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so this is just showing you an example of how the system works, and um, we had to work really hard to get the machine learning algorithms to run in real time on device. Now I have to find a way to. So right now it reads about um, 20 different facial expressions, things, you know, like usual suspects like a smile or a brow furrow or a brow raise, um, which are becoming easier and easier for, for a machine to detect. But harder ones like, you know, the crow feet wrinkles or a lip suck or um, uh, an ice quint, like some of these are really, really hard even for humans to detect. And we've also trained it to detect age, ethnicity, and gender, and I'll talk about why um, this is important as well. So the way this works is we feed it tens of thousands of examples of, say, people smiling or people frowning, and um, then it's fed into a convolutional neural net. We've explored different versions of it. I'm happy to go into any level of detail for anybody who's interested. Um, it's kind of a non-trivial problem to explore what kind of neural net works the best especially because facial expressions are dynamic, so we're very interested in how an expression unfolds over time, and, and there's important clues to be had from that kind of data. And then we map it into these kinds of emotional states. Um, about a few years, a couple of years ago, we, we, we recognized that there's a lot of applications of this research, so we packaged the core emotion engine into an SDK um, as well as APIs, and we made it available on, like, almost every platform you can think about. So iOS, Android, Unity, um, JavaScript, Linux, Raspberry Pi, if you're, you know, if you're experimenting with interactive real-time experiences. Um, because our vision is to really help people emotion enable their apps. We don't want people to spend hours and hours rebuilding what we've built. We just want them to be able to get access to that and focus on their use case. And so we do a lot of fun things like you know, hackathons and meetups. Um, if you're ever interested in hosting a hackathon, we'd, lo we'd love to help with that. Um, and we've had people, you know, prototype or hack a robot um, or chatbots or um, NBC had a, had a hackathon where, um, where they used our technology to create responsive media. And then we're always adding more. So right now we're about at about 20 different facial expressions. We have about 15 more to go, plus the combinations of these expressions to portray emotional states. There's a lot of work to do, so I've had really fascinating discussions this morning around what does the facial expression of guilt look like? Or what does the facial expression of pride or inspiration? Um, nobody's really researched this kind of, um, these kind of complex emotions. There's been a lot of work around the basic ones, which are like happy, sad, anger, surprise, and disgust but very, very little research around some of these more complex emotions. Um, so we're very interested in that kind of work. Um, we also get approached a lot to measure the response of a crowd, like, you know, for example, you know, what if I wanted to measure the engagement level of, of this audience? Um, so you could imagine a camera that could be processing your expressions in real time, and so we do a lot of work around face detection and making sure that even you know, even for profile faces like Obama's face here, we're still able to detect the face and track it. Now, one of the questions that comes up a lot in, in AI is guarding against biases. And you may have heard in the news there was a lot of debate around this chatbot that was 
um, trained on a particular set of data, so it ended up being um, um, basically cyberbullying um, online. And so we think a lot about biases. In our case, the bias can manifest in, um, in the following. So if you train a smile classifier on a middle-aged white guy and then you apply it in you know, China, on women in China, it's not going to be able to accurately detect um, that expression. So the more, um, the more varied the training data, the better or the, and the more robust um, the classifiers are. So in this particular example, this is the data we fed to the SMILE classifier. We make sure that the, there's an equal balance of male and female data. And also, um, we make sure that there's an equal representation as much as we can. Sometimes the data is hard to get in terms of es ethnicity. So why is this exciting? So for many, many years, people have been doing emotion research and the um, kind of the, the sensor, if you like, is, is self-report. But now we can capture this unfiltered, unbiased, immediate emotional responses, sometimes visceral emotion responses, and we can do that at scale. Um, and, and so that's never existed before. In this particular case, we mapped out people's responses to content across the US. We have this data for about 75 countries. I'll, I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, and so you can map people's levels of, of, of enjoyment or intensity of emotion, and you can tie it to world events. Um, and that allows us to start doing longitudinal emotional and mood tracking. So um, that's, that's very exciting. So, so far, we've collected data from 75 countries. We have about 5 million faces analyzed. It's, um, amounts to about 50 billion emotion data points. You can see that the US is our biggest source of data, but um, you know, we do a lot of work in Asia as well. All right, so what have we learned from this data so far? Um, we often get asked, like, are facial expressions cross cult are they universal, right? Um, and we, what we found in our experience is that the, the core facial expressions are universal, like a, a smile is a smile everywhere, but the decision of when to activate it really depends on cultural norms. And so we found that you know, in, in an Asian population, for instance, people are less likely to emote or express their emotion in the presence of strangers. And, we, and, and so that also factors into how we collect the data. So in this chart, what you're seeing here is the intensity of the emotion on the x and y axis and the color of the bubble. Uh, every, every circle is an individual. And you can see that in Europe and Latin America, we're seeing a lot more emotion expressiveness compared to Asian. Oops. Um. Um, so you'll see that um, if you compared like a Japanese person here to a Brazilian person up there, you'll just infer that the Japanese person isn't expressive at all. But that's not true. So we've created benchmarks that are very specific to a region or an ethnic group or um, a subpopulation. And then we create norms within that subpopulation. So um, you take that same kind of bubble of Asians where you think they're not expressing at all, and you can actually differentiate between a highly expressive Japanese individual and a, and a, and a less expressive person, Japanese person. So we found that these benchmarks and norms um, tended to be very important in how we interpret the data. We also found that expressions come in many flavors. So there's like many manifestations of a smile. And it depends on the intensity of the smile, the duration of the smile, what other action units are invoked. So, you know, if you just smile with your mouth, that's, that's typically a fake smile. It's not necessarily an enjoyment smile. An enjoyment smile tends to invoke both the facial expression of, of your, your lips, but your eyes as well. Um, and we were able to find things like you know, a very subtle smile that is short in duration and kind of almost like a politeness smile. It's not really enjoyment. All the way to a very intense smile, which is this one. Often, often in response to a, a humorous kind of hu a humorous uh, remark. I found that women are more expressive than men. 
um, it's not maybe very surprising. So okay, this is like really not working. Okay. Sorry. This is very loose. Yeah, so we found that women are generally more expressive than men. They tend to express more expressions, but also their smiles, for instance, lasted longer. But we also found that this gender difference varies by culture. So in the US, women were 40% more likely to smile than men. In France, it was only 25%. And in the UK, we found no significant difference between um, men and women, which is... Intriguing. <laughs> any, any Brits here? No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, we found that older people um, express more emotion than, than younger people. All right, so some of the use cases. Um, the very first um, kind of product where we got a lot of interest or area or industry where we got a lot of interest is advertising. So we worked with a third of the Fortune Global 100 companies to test their ads. So we tested a lot of the super ads that aired yesterday, for instance. Um, and I, I thought I'd show you some examples. So let's start with... So the way we collect this data is we send a URL out to a number of panelists. We ask for their permission to turn the camera on. If they say yes, um, we collect their facial expressions and then we aggregate it all um, together. So here you're seeing uh, 53 people respond to this um, M&M's ad. Um, and the blue line is the male respondents, and the pink line is the female respondents. Mr. Prime Minister, I'm flattered that you love chocolate, but I'm here strictly in a professional. What's wrong with him? And we're looking at their valence curve, which is how positive or negative they're feeling. It just looks like my milk chocolate is showing. Only a fool would think I'd actually show up naked. So it's that kind of party. Hit it! I'm sexy and I know it. So you can see there's, you know, a big spike in the, in the smile responses. <laughs> so this is another ad. This is one of the most powerful ads we've tested actually ever. Um, and it was a, um, an ad for Dove. Um, and I'll just explain how this, how this works. So as the ad progresses, the expression becomes more and more negative and, and until it dips, like this is the most negative part of the ad. And I'll just play it. Um, whoops. She's an example of a response that we got, and you can start seeing her face scrunch up with younger, smaller, lighter, thinner, tighter, thinner, softer. It really works. Did you see the, the nose wrinkles? We often get asked. Um, we often get asked if people still express emotions when they're just uh, sitting alone in front of a laptop, and that was the kind of the first question we had to answer. And, and the answer is yes. People are totally emotive. Um, obviously, it depends on the content, but we see a wide range of expressions, both positive and negative, even when people are just watching content alone or playing a game on their own. 
We've also done things like these fun spectrograms where we've laid out the different facial expressions. If it's green, then it's a positive expression. If it's um, red or orange, the, then it's negative. If it's blue, it's neutral. And this was a clip out of the Lion King um, scene when uh, Mufasa dies. And you can see that people kind of had a, an initial positive response because they recognized that this was Lion King. But very quickly, you can see a lot of negative expressions, and especially um, you know, expressions of sadness towards the end. So that's a different visual way of representing all this data. We also do a lot of research where people are like, okay, like, so what? So people smile to my ad or they found it humorous. Like, so what? How does that translate to consumer behavior? So we do a lot of um, predictive analytics where we look at the correlation between your emotional engagement and things like purchase intent actual sales um, of a product and, and virality. So for instance, ads with a strong positive response like that M&M's ad, where you see a strong positive dynamic towards the end, tend to lead to four, you're four times as likely to buy this product um, than if it were kind of a flat um, ad. We've seen also things like in the US, pet care and baby care ads elicit the, more, the most enjoyment. In Canada, it's the cereal ads. <laughs> um, um, and this is a fun example too. So we work with CBS um, a lot and we've tested one of their sitcoms. And the idea was to look at people's um, responses to the different characters in the sitcom. And you'll see that every time these two particular characters show up, um, people were not laughing. It was. I mean, it was obvious, right? Like, they're just not funny. So CBS ended up swapping, swapping them out. <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> and then ultimately, there's this idea of responsive narrative. So, you know, as people, when we tell stories, we definitely look at the audience's response and adapt the story in real time, right? Like, you'll, you'll watch for people's signs of, you know, for a person's sign of engagement or, are they bored or not? And then you kind of up at the level or change it up a little bit. But, but our, our online content does not do that. And so there's this idea of responsive narrative. And I'll just show you a quick um, example that was, not, that was developed by the future of storytelling. This is... Um... You see, with emotionally intelligent technology, interfaces are replaced with faces. What if two people had entirely different experiences watching the same content, all based on how they felt? That's where responsive media comes in. For example, let's say a whole family loves mysteries, but dad is really grossed out by all the blood. Mom loves it. Hal likes all the romantic scenes, even though he says he doesn't. So dad's version is a little light on the blood and heavier on the comedy. Mom's is a complete bloodbath and Hal's is a sweeping love story. And so in that world, what if our entertainment could react to our emotions in real time? And we had a discussion today at the uh, Daily, Daily, Daily Lab? Daily Lab, Daily Lab, um, about what if books could be responsive as well. It doesn't just have to be videos, but what if you're reading a book and we each kind of see a different version of the book depending on how we engage with it. Gaming is another area where we see a lot of interest. This particular game is a biofeedback game, so it's designed to um, help people learn how to be mindful and, and calm under stress. So it's a horror game, and the scarier, um, yeah, the scarier you, you are, or the, the, you know, the, 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 the more anxiety you show, the harder the game becomes, the scarier the game becomes. So the idea is you're supposed to train yourself to be less stressed, and that's how you win the game. There's also this idea of an esports meter. So this is not implemented. This is this is just an idea where um, if, you know players could read or see the emotional engagement of the actual gamer, but also the the the, the crowd um, that's watching the game. I don't know if anybody's in, into esports here, but my my eight-year-old son he spends more time watching these games than actually playing them. <laughs> um. Video communications and human resources is another area. We are partnered with a company called HireVue that instead of, so they want to humanize the application process. So instead of sending in your Word, your Word resume and you can't really tell 
like your true character, you send in a video interview. So it's a five minute interview, you're answering questions like who you are, like what, you know, what are you passionate about? And um, using our technology, they analyze the facial expressions. They also look at what you've said and your, your speech features. And then they rank you based on how um, y your, your social skills are. And this matters a lot for some of the jobs that they screen for, things like flight attendants or salespeople, where it really matters, these kind of social skills really matter. Um, they also have a coaching product where it gives you feedback on how you're doing. So it can say, well, you've said, um, like a hundred times, um, stop doing that or, you know, show more emotions or show more, more positive emotions. We've done, we've collaborated with them and we looked at about 13 and a half thousand job interviews trying to identify like how do we, like how do we tell the difference between the top performers and the bottom performers. And we, our theory going in was that people who showed more positive emotions were going to do better. Um, but it turns out people who show a wider range of emotions do better. So it's more about auth being authentic and genuine, not just being about like smiley the whole time, but actually being able to activate and show a wide range of emotions, bo both positive and negative. Um, education is another area that is, that is quite interesting. So this is an example of a learning app that uses the camera on the iPad to read the emotion engagement of, of the student and it adapts the content in real time. Um, and this, this could be used as an early predictor for learning outcomes, right? So you can predict early on if a student is engaged or not. Are they gonna drop out of the course? Are they gonna quit? Um, are they really paying attention? And you can intervene early enough, whereas if you wait till, you know, till they actually get the grade or it's the end of the course, it's too late to, to intervene. Um, this is another cool example. So it's a social robot um, that was developed at MIT Media Lab and they integrated our technology into the robot so it's emotion aware. And it's designed to be a learning companion. So it's not a teacher, it's more of a friend that's learning alongside with you. They've deployed it um, in an elementary school in Boston uh, with 34 kids who are learning Spanish. So I'll show you um, the video. Will you come on this adventure with me and help me learn Spanish? What I find fascinating is how these kids interact with these robots. Look at the like the gesturing and the exchange of eye contact. So we found that the robot, that there were two versions of the robot, one that was just not emotion aware. It, it, it kind of responded consistently um, every time it interacted with the kids. And then there was the socially or emotionally aware robot that sometimes mirrored the kid. So if the kid was bummed, it would be bummed too. Sometimes it would try to get the kid kind of out of their frustration state and motivate them. And the kids learned a lot more words and were generally more engaged with that version of the robot. And then switching to consumer and mental health, um, as I said, you know, we are obviously spending hours and hours interacting with our devices. What if, what if like every time you checked into your phone or your laptop, that's an emotional data point. That's an opportunity to, to get a, che you know, a, a, a check on your mental and emotional state. And there's applications, everything from clinical trials and testing efficacy of drugs and cognitive therapies to remote measurement of emotional and mental well-being. Um, so back to the autism um, example, we often get asked like, okay, so you did all this autism research at MIT, what happened to it? So we're now partnered with a company called Brain Power. Um, they came out of Harvard. They use Google Glass plus our technology to build these games for autistic kids. And they're currently in a clinical trial, and I'll just show you a short clip um, from one of their of the kids. Mom, 
Eight-year-old Matthew Krieger has been diagnosed with autism. A lot of the trouble he gets into with other kids is he thinks he's funny and doesn't read at all that he's not or that they're annoyed or angry. Matthew's mother, Laura, signed him up for a clinical trial being conducted by Ned Sahin. I want to know what's going on inside the, the brain of someone with autism. And it turns out parents want to know that too. You get points for looking for a while and then even for looking away and then looking back. Sahin's company BrainPower uses Affectiva software in programs Matthew sees through Google Glass. These games are trying to help him understand how facial expressions correspond to emotions and learn social cues. One of the key life skills is understanding the emotions of others. And another is looking in their direction when they're speaking. Looking at, at your mom, and while it's green, you're getting points. When it starts to get orange and red, you're, you'll slow down with the points. Am I looking at you? You are looking at me. Just a few minutes later, the oh, difference in Matthew's oh, gaze overwhelmed his mother. I'm going to cry. <laughs> Why? Just when you look at me, it makes me think we haven't really before because we're looking at me differently. Um, so as I said, they're in the middle of a clinical trial. One of the questions is, it, so it sounds like there is um, a, lot, like a lot of promising or a lot of promise around temporary increase in, in the amount of eye contact they do and also like their understanding of facial expressions. The question is whether that translates you know, over time when they stop using Google Glass as an assistive or a training technology. This is another cool example too. So we have our technology on our website. People are free to, to download it and use it for all sorts of things. Um, this was a high school student um, in Kansas and she was watching the news one night. It was about Parkinson's and she noticed that um, some of the patients, their facial expressions were off. And so she started kind of wondering, would, uh, would it be possible to um, use facial expressions as a biomarker or as an early predictor of Parkinson's. So she goes on Google and she's like, I wonder if anybody's built like technology that reads your facial expressions. And she comes across our website. She downloads our technology, collects data from about 30 people with Parkinson's, teams up with the Michael J. Fox Foundation, um, and she's essentially now working very closely with them to, um, to, to, to kind of roll out a technology that can can first collect a lot of data and then get a better sense of, um, you know, what are these biomarkers and what are these telltale signs? Um, and, and I just find this fascinating because the barrier to entry in terms of doing some of this research has now been really lowered. And so there's exciting opportunities there. Depression tracking and suicide um, assessment is another, is another one that's kind of very interesting and I, I think it has a lot of uh, potential for impact. Um, again, if you leverage the fact that people are spending so much time on their machines, um, there has been early um, studies that have been done in academia, so the, the N, the number of participants, isn't huge. Um, but there's early signs, like less action unit 12, there's less smiling, there's more signs of contempt, which is the upper lip raiser. Um, there's reduced overall facial expressiveness, um, droopy lids. So all of these facial biomarkers can be used to first kind of establish a baseline for individuals. And then if you have enough data about that person, you can start telling if they're deviating from their baseline and you can flag that um, to, you know, to, a, to a clinician or a parent or even the individual. Um, yeah, so we're, we're very interested in, in finding a partner that can help us roll out a large-scale study um, to look at this in a more systematic way. We are partnered with um, Stephen Vinoy at UM UMass Boston. He has this theory, he's particularly interested in suicide, and he has this theory um, based on some pilot data where he's found that people who are suicidal are less averse to really violent content. Um, and so he wants to use that to flag, you know, to flag suicidal um, individuals. And pain detection is another one. Um, I don't know how many people have seen this pain rating scale where like you're asked on a scale from one to five or one to 10 to articulate how much pain you're in. Now it's very, very subjective and there's a lot of interest to quantify that in a much more objective way. And again, we have preliminary data, um, not just us, but other labs around um, the world 
um, to demonstrate that you can detect pain. In fact, you can detect even fake pain from true pain um, based on what facial actions and what facial muscles are activated. Um, but this is still in the kind of the realm of research. It hasn't been commercialized yet. So from that, automotive is another interesting use case as well. Um, we have been approached by a lot of automotive companies kind of to detect drowsiness and distracted driving in the cars of today. I don't know what they're called where you actually have a driver. Um, but there's a lot of interest in autonomous vehicles as well where, um, you know, there's a question mark around, okay, when do you tra transfer power or um, um, control from the car to a driver? Because um, you can't just transfer control. You have to make sure that the driver is attentive and is awake, et cetera. Um, but also even just measuring the level of anxiety or frustration within the you know, of the passengers within an autonomous vehicle. There's a lot of interest around that as well. Um, so this is a study that we recently did where we collected data. Um, some of it is our, our team, so we have permission to share those videos, but a lot of it is people we've asked to drive around Boston with a camera in their dashboard, um, and we just use that data to train our algorithms. Um, it's a lot more challenging data because, as you can see, you know, um, sometimes the steering wheel come, you know, occludes the face. Um, the lighting conditions are tough. Um, so yeah, sometimes people are wearing sunglasses, which makes it a lot harder for the computer to read your emotions when you do that. Um, anyway, so that's kind of another frontier where we're um, exploring how do you measure like cognitive load or distraction or attention in, in contexts like this. And then from then on, this idea of a conversational interface, and it could be a car, like an automotive car, an, a, a, an autonomous car is really a conversational interface. Uh, and so is Tega the robot, or Jibo, or Mabo, which is a, is a, um, a, a social robot designed to be a companion for termini terminally ill patients. Um, so it's designed to help you stick to your um, therapy or your medication and kind of be a, a helpful companion. Um, so these are all examples of an embodied conversational agent like um, an Alexa. But it could also be an avatar on your phone or even your Siri. Um, so we're beginning to see a lot of these conversational interfaces start to have some level of empathy and some level of social and emotional skills. And so basically the idea here is that we see this world where this becomes embedded in a lot of, um, in a lot of use cases. And um, this brings with it a lot of ethical and moral questions and implications, really. So I'll just cover, you know, I'll just kind of touch on a few. So the first one, which is very important to us as a team, is privacy and opt-in. So everything we've done to date, people have given us explicit permission to turn the camera on. Um, and so we've stayed away from use cases where that's not the case, like surveillance or security, where we could probably make a lot of money as a company and as a team, but we just feel it's not right that people don't know that they're being monitored in this way. We also feel strongly about use cases where there's value in it for the consumer, and that could be monetary value, so we sometimes pay people to turn the camera on, or it could be social value, so it's a, an experience that's better, that's enhanced because the robot you know, can build rapport or can, be, can build trust with you. Um, autonomy is another key kind of um, ethical question. So if, you know, if I have a chatbot or a social robot and my daughter, who's a teenager, has her own chatbot or social bot, can her bot share data with me? Like if it, senses, if it senses that my daughter is upset or depressed, does it have permission or autonomy to share this kind of data? So there's a lot of questions around can this thing, can this chatbot or um, um, AI share data on your behalf, and who does it have permission to share it with and when. Um, we are often involved in a lot of conversations around skilling. So with, with these AI systems, we're going to see a lot of jobs go out of um, existence, but we're hopefully going to see new jobs exist as well. Um, and in a world where it's a combination, like we're a combination of a human and a robot team, we talk a lot about what skills the robot needs to have. So it needs to have empathy and it needs to have social and emotional intelligence. But what about humans? Like what about people who are going to work alongside these robots? What kind of skills um, and, and traits and abilities do they need to have? And it's things like maybe patience or you need to be flexible or kind. I don't know what they are, but 
Um, it's kind of an interesting question too. Yeah, and then ultimately there's a lot of questions around morality and, and you alluded to that, Dan, like this idea of a moral machine. Um, and so we're at the, we find ourselves at the forefront of some of these conversations through something like the World Economic Forum, but we're also putting our own emotion AI think tank. So we bring together thought leaders who will have a, a stake in this, um, in this kind of emerging field. They could be machine learning scientists or they could be automotive folks or you know, other, other kind of uh, um, both industry and, and researchers. Um, so if you're interested in that at all, please, please come talk to me. Um, we also partnered with the X Prize. Um, they have this $5 million prize if you build uh, an AI system. Um, and so we've made our technology available for anybody who participates in that uh, competition for free. Um, so that's exciting too. I think the deadline's coming up or it's about to, it's about to close if you're interested. Um, so what is the future? What's, the, what's next for Emotion AI? As I said, I, I like to liken the level or, or the state of this technology to a toddler in terms of the abilities of its social and emotional um, skills. There's a lot of research to be done around multimodal. We've only started to combine face and speech. So we look at speech prosody, laughter, pauses, and we combine that with facial expressions. But there's a lot, of, um, there's a lot more research to be done there. Um, unsupervised learning is another area. So we have about 12 billion emotion or facial frames. We only use less than 10% of that in our training data because we have to get it labeled, which is a huge bottleneck. Um, so um, to the extent that we can leverage unsupervised learning approaches to leverage all that data to train our algorithms, that would totally expedite um, our research roadmap. Some of the deep learning systems that we develop are hugely computationally intensive, so it's hard to deploy them on something like a mobile phone or a Raspberry Pi, so model compression is another area of research. And I think the most interesting one is this idea of a context-specific emotional model, so what's that? Um, as I said, there's just been a lot of, there's a very simplified notion of how you go from a facial expression to an emotional state. Um, and there's a lot more research to be done in that mapping. Like, how do you go from looking at somebody's facial expression and saying, oh, they're confused, or oh, they're interested? Um, I think that's been really simplified, and we need, we need a lot more data to be able to quantify, like, you know, what is the facial expression of pride, or what's the facial expression of um, inspiration? One more thing on this one too. So when I, when, when I started Affectiva and left MIT, I thought that that was the end of my research career. <clears throat> but what I found is that as a company, because we have this much data and because we have this scalable platform, we do have an opportunity to push the state of the art in terms of machine learning, computer vision, psychology research. And so we're always on the lookout for partners that we can collaborate with. Um, we don't have permission to share our data publicly, but we're very open to people who want to come and access it um, on site. We're very big on publishing. We, we think that's important. It's a, it's a big role. You know, I think we're kind of obliged. We have an obligation to the research community to publish some of these findings to push the entire field forward. Um, so again, if any of this inspires you or interests you, please come talk to me and we'll find a way to collaborate. Yeah, and then ultimately we envision this future where our technology has, um, all our devices really can have this emotion chip. It could be a combination of a camera and a microphone, and it's tiny and it sits on, you know, your phone or your smart TV or in your car or your robot, and it adapts and responds to your emotions in real time. And um, it's almost like, you know, now we, we all rely on GPS for all sorts of things, but when it first appeared, everybody was freaking out, and it was like, no, I don't want this technology to know where I am. But now there's enough value in it that people have accepted it, by and large. Um, and so we envision a world where in the future we'll kind of forget what it was like when devices didn't really have, em have emotion awareness, and we'll just take it for granted that, yeah, I expect... I mean, my, my son... Um, plays a lot with robots, and he kind of expects the robot to, to, to be responsive to him. <laughs> um, in fact, I, 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 um, 
I remember asking his class, like, how many people would like a robotic companion, and they all wanted, like, a, a robot friend to help them with their math homework or, you know, a robot friend to bring to school. And they, everybody, like, all 20 kids thought the robot, of course, had emotions. Like, they didn't even, you know, they didn't even question that. Um, of course, the robot does not have emotions. <laughs> not yet, anyhow. Anyways, yeah, so uh, lots to do, but uh, exciting stuff. Thank you. Questions, anyone? Oh. <laughs> okay. A lot of questions. A lot of questions. So, Shona, do we have a mic? So um, there, is, there, there seems to be research that shows there are tells for whether you're telling the truth or not. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to figure out whether your technology can determine that? Could I wa use it to watch the news and determine whether the news is true uh, or not? Right. <laughs> um, fake news, yeah. Um, so the theory is when, when people are lying, um, there's this thing called a micro-expression. So it's a, it's a facial slip, it's an expression slip. And basically, it is, um, it's, a, it's a very fast and fleeting facial expression. Um, <clears throat> we process video frames at about 30 frames per second. I know these guys do it at 120 frames a second. So theoretically speaking, we are able to detect um, a lot of these um, expressions. We, but, but generally speaking, we've stayed away from deception detection or lie detection from a use, as a use case, even though the technology can do it. Um, be because we're focused on more of the applications where we feel that people want to share their emotions and it's just not getting across, as opposed to the use case where you're trying to hide your emotions. Yeah. Um. I was struck by the example you gave of the family where everybody wanted a different kind of movie. Uh -huh. And it seem, seems to me that that will not make the family closer. Mm -hmm. So do you consider those kinds, of, you know, that reality and who thinks about that? That is a great question. So yeah, I can see how that, like, like the advantage of, of all of us kind of going through the same book or the same narrative is exactly. it's a shared experience. Exactly. And, and you don't get that if, if, you, if you change that. Yeah, so I, you know, I don't know where the line is between creating these personalized experiences versus these shared experiences. I'd be curious to hear people's thoughts, actually. Well, um, I, I am very aware of that already in having grown up in, at the time when we had, we all were listening to the same music and now I go to the gym and everybody is plugged into who knows what. Right. And maybe it's all the same, I don't know. <laughs> but we're not all, you know, bobbing our head at the same time. And to me, it, it, there's such a, um, an absence of community. Yeah. That was, that was a concern of mine. I think that's actually a great, um, that's a different way to look at it. Like on the spectrum of personalized experiences, not just through our technology, but a lot of other personalization mechanisms, all the way to this like shared experience. Where's the right balance and what's the trade-off? Yeah, we don't talk a lot about that. It's cool. I think there's a question here. I, I, I hope this hasn't been covered. I don't hear too well, so maybe it has. But at any rate, yes. do you see, as we look to the future, mm -hmm. um, through facial recognition, the prediction of my actual action. As a, for instance, mm -hmm. in a, a, an automobile is a good example. I may have an expression on my face. Can it detect whether or not it's panic and I fail to put the brakes on? Or can they tell it that it's not panic and I'm rational and I do put the brakes on? Uh, you, you get what I'm talking yes, about? Yes, absolutely. I think we will get there. Uh, no, we're not quite there yet for the automotive application because we need a lot more data of people kind of being in that situation. But I will give you an example in the, uh, not in this like most recent election cycle, but the previous one, 
we were able to predict people's voting behavior just based on how they responded at the president, just based on their facial expression, their voting, who they voted for, just by looking at their facial responses to the different candidates. And in fact, it was it just boiled down to where they smirked. So when they showed this kind of expression, like that kind of contempt or asymmetric um, the corner pull, that was very, very predictive of who they resonated with or not. Um, so I think we are, I think with enough data in these different situations, we, we can, um, we would be able to predict people's behavior. Um, yeah. Okay. There's a question here. I think you're getting a mic. I really wish you were around. I really wish you were around 30 years ago. Because that's when I started with a colleague of mine to look at this last uh, question of the role of facial expressions of emotion in politics. And I can tell you that it is huger even than you imagine. It really is important. Mm -hmm. I would like to chat with you afterwards. But getting at any situation where there is dominance and subordination or complex social relations, this, this is terrific work you're doing. Congratulations. It's really great. Thank you. Thank you. There's a lot, there is a lot of open questions though, right? There's a lot of research. And our hope is this kind of technology can expedite it so we can collect a lot more. It would have a huge effect on, on research. Yeah. Huge. I'd love to talk more. When I look at your, your better education outcomes with adaptive learning systems, one of the problems with adaptive learning systems has been the kind of the atemporal nature of assessment. Mm -hmm. um, so with, with your system, um, the granularity, okay, and the instantaneous nature of actually picking up when a student becomes confused. Mm -hmm. So can, can you uh, elaborate a little bit as to who's working with you on the adaptive learning systems? Um, so right now we're, we're basically, so, uh, so, so take as one example, and then the other one is this company that, that's building the app. I will say that right now there's not enough, so we're focused on the um, detection of the facial expression, but the other side of the coin is the adaptation part. And right now it's super simplistic. It's like if, you know, if brow furrow persists for three seconds and the intensity is over 50%, then you know, the learning app says blah, blah. It is very, very coarse and explicit. And that's not how humans interact, right? And I think, yeah, I think there's a lot more research to be done around how do you, how do you make the system respond so that it's, you know it's doing the right thing, but you don't exactly know why or how, right? Um, and I'd, yeah, I'd be curious if you have any thoughts on that. We have a question here, okay. So I was really interested about the emotional expression during interviews mm -hmm. and um, basically selecting certain emotional expressions over others. Could you imagine a future where once everyone realizes they're being watched and ranked on emotional expressiveness, you know, everyone is per, you know, expressing a certain strain of emotions that isn't exactly tied to their actual emotional <laughs> experience? We, we had that debate over lunch today. Um, it was an interesting discussion. I think we're already kind of trying to game the system in our word resumes, right? Like we, you have all these like workshops where you can go and you spiff up your resume to make it look awesome or whatever. And I think with time, there's going to be maybe even like a new industry, right, of, of, um, of consultants that help you like really craft your expressions. In fact, one, um, this person I was in, uh, talking to last week, she has a consulting, a, a consulting company where she trains doctors. So apparently, I did not know that. But doctors have to go through two types of tests. One is very technical, so it's about their medical abilities. And one is an empathy test. So they sit in front of a panel of judges and they interact with a patient and the patient has to rate how empathetic they were and, um, and, the, and the judges too. And, and people actually fail that test because they're not empathetic enough. So her job is to help them be more empathetic. The problem is that she has no way of quantifying success unless, you know, at the end, whether they pass or fail. Um, so I, I think there is going to be a market for... Yeah, for, for kind of improving. Yeah, and there's definitely a lot of interest in public speaking too, right? 
and, and coaching? You know, how do you, you know, can I practice my TED talk over and over again and, and know if I'm getting better and becoming more engaging or more confident or more inspiring, whatever it is? So I appreciate that expression this for the expression coaches, but do you think there's any downside to the fact that, you know, if there's this whole time that we're trying to express an emotion that isn't our actual inside emotion, we're losing some of that contact between each other and what we're seeing isn't really what's happening. Yeah, I, I do think there is a downside. And I actually also, also think, um, like not all jobs require social skills, right? Um, and w I mean, we've worked a lot with autistic kids that are amazing at pattern recognition and doing repetitive tasks and that, that's what they wanna do. They're not gonna be very strong, um, you know, socially. Um, but then, you know, that that's totally fine. It just means that maybe they don't, you know, maybe being a flight attendant isn't the best job for it. Like, it's not, a, it's a mismatch, right? Um, yeah. We have a couple of questions here. Shana. So, um, in terms of, like, skilling, whenever... In your program, basically, uh, in terms of emotional intelligence, is there a point where you think that your program or algorithm will be better or more adept at doing it than we are? Because there are points where I can walk into a room. Oh, I apologize. Um, I'll repeat. Basically, is there a point where you think that your algorithm will be more adept, adept in uh, telling like emotional intelligence better than we are? Because there are points where I can walk in somewhere and I believe like everybody's happy but it's the complete opposite mm -hmm. and sometimes it's like I'm pretty sure professors sometimes have this where they walk into a room like really excited and they think they're excited for the lecture but maybe not anyway <laughs> um, but in terms of things like that do you think less like in terms of labor for skilling but more like for us would it change the way that we emotionally interact with each other if we're expecting something else to be better at it than we are um, so I think we're not there yet. Right. So I don't, no, I don't, maybe not in our lifetime, but right. The although, future. although I would say like a system that is reading like the audience response is probably better than I am right now because I'm overloaded. I, I'm like, I'm having to think about how am I going to answer your question, but also like, right, I'm doing all this in real time. Whereas, um, you could imagine a system that can augment, augment my abilities very easily, like just with a camera, it can read all of you like in real time, da, 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 and in real time kind of feed me some information about that. So I think when we're thinking about scale, I think some of these systems are already better than, than, than you know, the average Joe is. Um, I do think when it comes to familiar people, so people you've spent a lot of time with, where you, you know, you you know how you, you know you know how they express themselves, and you have a baseline for what they typically do, um, I don't think we're anyway as near anywhere as near. No, yeah. So I was wondering where you're heading with the app because right now. It seems sort of like a game, like Snapchat. Yeah. And especially with the camera right in your face, it's very hard to show sincere emotion. Yep. So it seems kind of forced. Like, for example, my floor is doing some emotional intelligence unit, and we have an app, and we manually track our emotions. Mm -hmm. And how it helps mm -hmm. is, at the end of the week, it tells you, like, oh, this many, this oh. percentage of the week, you were this emotion or something like that. Wait, and does this app exist? Yeah, or not like an AI, it's like, how do you feel right now? Oh, right, and then like you, yeah, yeah. Right, so then um, what it does... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, wow. <laughs> but, um, so kind of like, oh, I feel angry. And it's like, where do you want to go? I want to go here. Oh, last time you were here, this is what you did. Got so it. I'm like wondering what practical aspect your app was heading Yeah, so the towards. app is just an example. It's, it's really a toy example just to show people the technology. We, we don't use it at all. Like, the, yeah, we're not really investing in the app itself. It's just a way to show what the technology can do. Um, I do think there's a really interesting use case around mood tracking. So if, you know, every time I pick up my phone, if it's able to take a snapshot of my emotional data instead of asking me to fill, you know, to do a survey, I think that could be very intriguing data. These apps are generally, like, the most, or the way to achieve a general audience. Right, totally. Yeah. <laughs> Last question over there. Yes. So when you were talking about how you could, well, the whole talk is about how you can track emotions, do you think that being able to read the faces could help 
in criminal interviews, seeing when they get uncomfortable. So that could give a key to the officer or um, person who's interviewing on, like, um, if that's an uncomfortable area, so they should look more into what that person was doing at X time. That's interesting to drill some more. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a, that is a very interesting application. Um, yeah, because you could, it's not just lie detection, so, so you could t totally use that to detect if they're lying or not, but I like how you articulated it as discomfort, right? Like, it, the, you know, you're probing into an area that is causing them stress or anxiety. Um, and I'm sure that a lot of officers, unless they're super, you know, super attuned to people's emotional cues, they may totally miss that. So I think that that's a very cool use case, a new one. <laughs> Haven't heard that one before. Um, Great. All right, well, let's thank Ron.